remember thy holy law and its sweet Sabbath or Lord of the Sabbath, Savior and Creator, come now the throbbings of each troubled breast. Speak to our hearts the peace of thy commandments. Breathe on its soul if your Eden's hallowed rest. Strong in thy might and quiet in thy weakness, may we thine image bear from day to day. Then may we enter pearly gates eternal and sing redemption song each Sabbath day. And our next song will be All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. That's number two, two. Number 229, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and cry. Beautiful. All right, so our next one will be Rescue the Perishing. That's number 367. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep o'er the erring ones, lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus. 
Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are slighting him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive if they only believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing. Duty demands it, strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor one where the Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Thank you so much for your lovely singing. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. When we're still able to smile, lend a caring word and assist others, despite our mood, it is a true test of character as Christians. Even on the cross, when Christ was being crucified, he was still able to put his feelings aside and focus on his mission. We too have a similar mission to Christ. He came to die so that we could live and we are to share with others so they can experience it. It's not that we aren't expected to have bad days, but we should be extra mindful of how we act during those days. And because of this, in spite of our bad days, today we're going to show up in our cities and we are going to teach, we're going to pray, and we are going to be there for our members. Today is Global Youth Day and we are going to be going out in our communities under the theme, show up in our cities. We're going to have Sister Maxine Robinson with our opening hymn. Our opening hymn is Heart the Voice of Jesus Calling, 359. That's number 359, Heart the Voice of Jesus Calling. Please, Please stand. stand. Heart the voice of Jesus calling, who will go and work today? Fields are white, the harvest waiting, who will bear the sheaves away?
them at your door. If you cannot speak like angels, if you cannot preach like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus. You can say he died for all. Sister Karen Coy Grant with a scripture reading, after which Sister Phyllis Scarlett will petition the throne of grace on our behalf. Our scripture passage comes to us from Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, and it reads, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal Father, indeed we are privileged to come once more into your courts to sing praises unto your name. As we come, we pray that you'll empty us of everything that is unlike you, so that our prayer can come up to you as sweet incense. Father, we have been battered this week, but we know you are there, your grace is sufficient to take us through. Bless us individually and collectively, and Lord, help us to be faithful until that great day when you shall come to take us home, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. The songwriter asks the question, who will answer? when Jesus calls, and we reply, here am I, O Lord, send me. In Matthew chapter 28, it says, we are to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. At this time, I'm going to ask all our teachers to stand. All our teachers, please stand. Teachers, you have three minutes in which to mark your blanks and interact with your members. And Sister Barbara Robinson will be doing our lesson review in one. Three minutes, teachers. I am going to ask 
Sister Sandra Simon Clark to pray on our behalf. Good morning, everyone. Let us get into the attitude of prayer. Eternal Father, we come before you this morning. We just want to thank you for this morning. Lord, you are such an awesome God. And for the privilege of coming out unmolested, we do say thanks. Even now, we're about to review that which we have studied. We ask that you may bring back to our remembrance. And may you help that as we share Sabbath after Sabbath, then our lives may be transformed. We thank you once more for hearing and for answering our prayers, even as we beg it in your son's name, as we say, amen. Good morning, Glenda Bon. Good morning, saints of God. Good morning, brothers and sisters, children, young people, and our adult members. Welcome to the house of God, and thank you for showing up today. As we come together for worship, we cannot do so adequately without studying the Word of God or discussing the Word of God. And this moment in Sabbath school is for us to interact uh, around the Word. And it means, therefore, that we should have something to share as we study. This morning, we'll have an abbreviated version of our Sabbath school discussion, but I will still hope that we have something that we want to share and of course, you will just raise your hand when you do, and we will talk together. We already have prayer, so let's go straight into our discussion. So this week's lesson, we are at lesson number 11, as we journey through the Psalms. The book of Psalms have been presenting to us some very important, instructive, interesting lessons that we may have seen them, we have studied, we have read them before, but they have now been presented to us in a way that is new and different and exciting. So this week we looked at longing for God in Zion. This is a lesson that we can all relate to by just being present in the house of God today. It's quite a fascinating lesson that the the nucleus of it is really about the presence, the very presence of the God we serve. So longing, who is longing for God in Zion? We, the lesson takes us on a journey to the house of God. Now, in the days of the Israelites, when they were in this wilderness, their place of worship was what? The sanctuary. That was a central part of their worship experience, the services of the sanctuary. When they got settled in Canaan, then the temple, the permanent structure, was erected and that was in Jerusalem. Now Zion is used in the scriptures synonymously with, the, with Jerusalem. So when you speak of Zion, you speak of Jerusalem as well right so the people didn't get up every sabbath like we do and go to zion they would go to or to jerusalem or go to the sanctuary wherever the physical structure was right they would go specific times each year now our church comprised mainly of women and the women did not go to Jerusalem as often as the men do, maybe just once per year. The men would go for the various feasts, but the women would only go once per year. So you can understand why the people longed for Zion. Because when they go to Zion, 
there was just a different kind of experience that they had, which we will be looking at uh, during our lesson review this morning. Now, the Seventh Adventist Church doesn't use the word Zion a lot. You agree with me? We don't talk about Zion except, Sister Park, Peter King, we are singing the song number 422, we are marching to Zion. Can I tell you something about that song? No, the early Adventists, the early Adventists, when they were singing hymns in worship, they did not sing hymns that were not exact words from the scripture. So they would sing, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Those songs, they will sing other songs that come specifically from the Psalms. Early Adventists I'm talking about. They were very opposed to singing any other songs that were not exactly taken out of the scripture. So one of the first songs that was introduced to the early Adventist was marching to Zion. Come we that love the Lord. And the church opposed it vehemently. We should not sing hymns that are not taken specifically out of the Bible. But guess what? Our church has evolved. And uh, we embrace these and many other wonderful hymns that talks about the experience of God's people as we march from the tribes. The tribes march from their various locations to the sanctuary. Or from Israelite march from the various communities to the temple in Jerusalem. Just as how we walk or we drive or we ride each week from our various homes to come to the house of God. Right? So Zion is the place that we look forward to each week. This is where we come for worship. This is where we come for fellowship. This is where we come for the word, to hear the word of God. This is where we come to be strengthened and to give strength to each other. And that's the essence of our lesson this week. So more, what, I'm, what I'll be doing is more of a summary than actually teaching because of the limited time that we have. But our memory text takes us to uh, Psalm 84 verse 2. And that's the focal chapter for this week's lesson. What does it say? We can repeat for those who had memorized it and for the, those who didn't, then you read. It says, my soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Now, David is, making a, is expressing a passionate desire to be in the presence of God and to know God. It's a passionate desire. Oh God, I long to be with my people. I long to be with the Lord in his presence. Now, when you think of Zion and Jerusalem, what is it that caused David to have this passionate longing? One, in Jerusalem there is the temple, or in Zion there is a temple. It's a place of worship we established. In the temple, you have the outer court, you have the holy place, and the most holy place. So when David longs for Zion, he's not just longing to be in this outer place or the holy place. He also thinks of the most holy place. And it is in the most holy place that we have what? The presence, the very presence of God. So when David longs for Zion, he's longing for the place where God's presence is. God's presence is manifested in Zion. He's longing not just for the, the temporary experience. Because when he goes to Zion on a monthly or a quarterly or a yearly basis, he's going to go back home. He's going to face the, the realities of life. But when he gets there, he gets enough, enough of God's presence, enough of God's power, enough of God's grace and his mercy and his truth that helps to carry him along until the next time he gets back. Remember, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Now, when he goes to Zion, he not only sees 
and beholds the glory and the beauty of God in his temple. But he also receives promises and hope for the future. So as we do not long for Zion today in the context of just coming to the church of God, our Zion that we look forward to more than coming to church is where? It's heaven. Because in heaven, that's where the next Zion is. That is where the new Jerusalem is. That is where God's very presence dwells. Right? So when we long for Zion, no, we also long for heaven, for eternity. Now, David, as he moved over into a little excerpt from Sunday's lesson, David says that this, not this David, sorry, the author for this week's lesson, this quarter's lesson, he says the sanctuary is the place where his relationship with God is established and nurtured. We establish when persons are invited to come to the house of God. There they meet Jesus and a relationship with him begins. Now, each time that we come, that relationship is nurtured through worship and fellowship with fellow believers. The living presence of God in the sanctuary gives the worshipers a glimpse of God's glorious kingdom and a taste of eternal life. The highest experience of pleasure and the joy that a human can experience is not drinking alcohol, it is not having sexual intercourse, it is not playing with your friends, it is worshiping God. It is the most pleasurable experience a human being can have. And where do we get that? When we come to the house of God. When we sing the praises of God together in his sanctuary. When we listen to the word of God preached and it hits a chord and a nerve inside our being. We cannot resist. We cannot hold back. We have to shout forth the praises of God. Isn't that so? So our hearts long for Zion. And when we look beyond what we experience here, we look forward to the Zion that awaits us, where we will dwell in the presence of God eternally. Now, Zion is not only for the Christian, for the saints. Zion exists for the entire world. Right? God is inviting us to share what we have received when we come to Zion with the family. The people who we live amongst. The people who we are of kindred spirits. Then he expects us when we go on the highways and the byways. Just this week I was in the Westgate shopping center area. And I heard the voice of someone saying, Jesus is coming my brother. And that hit a chord in my heart. And when I looked around to see who said it, it was a member of our church. Just calling to somebody, but he also says, Jesus is coming. So when we come to the Zion and we hear God's word, we cannot help but telling it to others when we ourselves have been positively impacted by that word. I see Sister Nurse, hands up. Oh, that's a great question, sis. And that's pushing us a little bit over into Monday's lesson. We are in Psalm 122. We are called to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, currently, there's a place in our world uh, down in the east, the Middle East, that is called Israel. And uh, in Israel, there's a place called Jerusalem. There is a yearly pilgrimage that people make, people from all over the world wants to go to Jerusalem because it is considered the central point of Christianity, right? So people want to go to Jerusalem. People refer to Jerusalem there as Zion and mostly in the, uh, in, in the nominal churches, they continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But guess what? Where Jerusalem is physically located, geographically located, there is currently a big 
war going on down there. So that cannot be the Jerusalem that we are invited to go and pray for. So yes, that Jerusalem and the Monday's lesson, we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem, the physical structure, the physical geographical uh, Jerusalem that exists today down in Israel for two reasons. One, we are to pray because currently as the war continues to rage, there are people dying, children are dying, people are being dislocated, uh, people are suffering from the ravages or all the evils that comes with war. And this is a war that has been fought for ages upon ages. So we are to pray for peace so that the Jewish people who live down that area and the Palestinians can experience some rest. However, there will be no peace, there will be no rest in Jerusalem on earth or in the earth all around until what? Jesus, the Prince of Peace establishes his kingdom so that will be world peace well world peace will not happen until jesus comes but the children of god can experience peace we can experience peace in our hearts when jesus dwells within us you want to contribute further to the question sis uh, would i be wrong to say that coming to church looking forward to come to church every week we are looking forward to go, going to Jerusalem. No, you're not wrong. You're correct. That is very correct. So, um, would, could we say then that this is our Zion? Good. And where you worship, where one or two are gathered, it would be called our Zion. And it would have been the highest place of worship because Jesus went to Zion to communicate with his father to worship so if we come here it's not on the hill it's down in the valley we are still in Zion yes worshiping we, Christ. we did establish that earlier that the the church the house of God is referred to as Zion so whether it was in the time of Israel or in our time right remember at the time we said that Jerusalem was a physical, physically located in a, as a central spot for the worship of the, of, of the God of heaven, right? But no, we don't go to Jerusalem to worship. We come here to the, 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 the structure where the church meets. So we together form the church, but we call the building church anyway. So this is our Zion, but we, in, in the physical sense, we look forward to coming here. But when we come here, it points us, we are directed to the Zion that awaits us in the kingdom of God. Brother Shippey. You have just said the end part, what I would say. When we remember Zion, at Psalms 1, 37 said, when we remember Zion, we hang a harp upon the willow because we cannot sing when we remember Zion. But as you had rightly said in the last end, when we met together like this today, it's the inroad of the heavenly Zion, our Jerusalem, where will we be? Amen. Now, you know, as the people of God journey towards Jerusalem, I see your hand, Elder Dockery, they journey towards Jerusalem for each pilgrimage. Sometimes, depending on how far they are journeying from, it will take them weeks and days, but along the way, they would be refreshed, right? God would provide refreshment. He'll provide covering. And so, as they near Jerusalem, they will sing. And the fact that they could see it afar, oh, that filled them with joy as they press along. And that's what happens when we come to the house of God each week. We receive strength and refreshing to press on until we get to the new Jerusalem. Elder Dockery. Oh, I didn't see his hand. Go ahead, Elder Bernard. The church that is Zion is supposed to be the most peaceful place. Why? We are transcending from the church to heaven. What we see going on in the Middle East 
if there is no repentance, no so-called Jew or Arab will go to heaven if they do not repent. The church, as a matter of fact, the Lord will not open the windows or the doors of heaven to take in no warring factions, irrespective of your affiliation to anything, a culture, a race, or anything. It is the people are the persons who have surrendered to God, who are experiencing peace on earth, those of us who have truly decided to live by the principles of God's grace. We are the ones who are going to experience it, who are experiencing the true Zion, and we are the ones who will be going to heaven. Amen. Thank you. Elder Dockery. Right. So just to mention as well, certainly... Whilst we look at the church, the physical building, we are coming here, we are coming to Zion. It is even more so in the figurative sense. Uh, know that wherever God's people meet together, when we go to camp, mm -hmm. we come together wherever God's people meet to worship him. We are in that figurative sense in Zion. And even if there is not a large group of people and there are two or three of us, once we are engaged in the worship experience and the presence of God is there, we are having a Zion experience. But I just also want to emphasize the point that we are to pray for peace in Jerusalem and in Zion that is the spiritual Jerusalem and Zion. Why? Because if there is not peace among God's people and that unity, Zion, the church, will not be able to fulfill its mandate. And I think that point was even made in the lesson as well. So it's very, very important that there be peace. Israel of old could not stand up against its enemies if there were separations and issues and all of that. And so for that reason, we must pray for peace and for unity in Zion so that we can truly bring the message of salvation and people can be saved, ready for the heavenly Zion. Amen. And it is on that point that we will close our discussion for this week. I remembered as a child, Brother Ambersley taught us a verse of scripture. He says, woe to them that are asleep in Zion. And so brothers and sisters, as we continue to study the word of God, study the Psalms, let us embrace and live by the precepts that we have been studied, that we have embraced for this week's lesson as we prepare and as our hearts continue to long for Zion. God bless you and thank you. Never let your bad days be the reason why a soul is lost for the kingdom because you were unkind and they know that you're a Christian. Always, always remember to treat others as you would like to be treated, whether they are happy or sad. Kindness costs nothing. Unkindness, on the other hand, costs a lot. When we practice being kind, even when we don't want to, it forms a habit which makes kindness become second nature after a while. Your attitude is a witness to others. Let it not become a deterrence to them joining the church or becoming a Christian. As we close a Sabbath school, March 16, 2024, under the theme, Be Kind Always. We're going to go out into the field today because today is Global Youth Day. Let us share a smile. Let us share a prayer. And always remember, brothers and sisters, to be kind today 
and every day onwards. Have a blessed day. Happy Sabbath all. All right. So today is Global Youth Day 2024. So these are the announcements for March 16, 2024. Today is Global Youth Day, and we will be going out into the community to pray and to fellowship with the members of the community. Uh, in the afternoon, we'll be at the West Jamaica Conference for a street march. That's where we'll meet. And we'll go down to Sam Sharp Square. So we're marching from West Jamaica Conference to Sam Sharp Square. And there we will have a town impact as the theme for Global Youth Day is show up in cities. Youth Week of Prayer begins tomorrow, March 17th. And it continues through to the 22nd of the month. The program will be a joint initiative with the youth of the Norwood Church, and we are asking you to join us online via the Zoom platform. Easter camp is March 28th through to April 1, 2024, and we'll be at the Belmont Academy in Westmoreland. Please see your AY leader, Sister Colleen Bingham, to make your payments today. The Master Guide Association, St. James Chapter, invites you to register for the MIT program. That's the Master Guide in Training program. Registration closes March 31st, 2024. Please see Master Guide Deandra Bingham Dunkley or yours truly, Master Guide Nicola Dunn, for more information. The, C the St. James Youth Federation invites you to register for the Senior Youth Program. Registration will be at the Harrison Memorial High School on March 24 at 10 a.m. Our Harvest Thanksgiving service will be on the 3rd of August, 2024. And our church trip will be on the 11th of August, 2024. We encourage you to start preparing and saving for these events. More information about the church trip will follow. May 18 is World Adventure Day. More information on the church trip will be shared as the time, as information is available. All right? Or, or May 18, 2024 is World Adventure Day. So let us start preparing our children for this event. Thanksgiving service for Sister Blight's brother will be March 31st at the Cornwall Mountain SDA Church in Westmoreland, and it begins at 11 a.m. Those who are interested in giving their support, please see Sister Blythe. And finally, communi communion service is Sabbath, March 23rd. That's Sabbath coming, and we are asked to prepare ourselves for this solemn event. I leave you with this thought. Your ministry is found where you are broken, but your testimony is where you have been restored. Have a blessed Sabbath.
the name of the Lord. Many of the members prayed because Glenn Devon is special to her. She requested our prayer and we are getting reports that yes, the surgery was successful. She is out of the operating theater and is doing well and I say to God be the glory. And so my brothers and sisters and there are so many others. Yes, the ones who have lost loved ones and those having various challenges in your families and so forth. We continue to pray for that. And so, yes, we stand at this time even as we sing our prayer uh, chorus, Sister Bernard. And even as your heart desires, feel free to walk to the altar as we have a short prayer placing our petitions before the Lord. Reach out and touch the Lord as he passes. You'll find him not too busy. You'll find he's not too busy. To hear your heart's cry. To hear your heart's cry. He's passing by this moment. He's passing by this moment. Your knees to supply. Reach out and touch the Lord. Reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. O loving, gracious God, our eternal Father, the one who sent your Son Jesus Christ. 
to die for us on Calvary to secure our salvation. We bless your name this morning, even as you have given us another privilege whereby we can come to Zion, whereby we can meet with your people together for no other reason but to worship and to exalt your high and matchless name and to do your work even as we give service to the community. We thank you, Lord, for the victories which you have given us through the past week. The prayers we prayed, you gave us answers. And even as we come, Lord, we have not just come to ask you to do this for us and to do that for us, but we have come to, from the depths of our heart, shout hallelujah. We have come to say thank you, Jesus. We have come to say thank Thank you, Lord, for being our prayer hearing and our prayer answering God. And so even as we come now, Lord, your people stand before you and they have marched to the altar. Oh, God, signaling to you in glory that they have needs, they have their desires, and that they have faith in you that even as they place their petitions before you you will respond according to your will and so yes Lord we place before your sister Anne Marie Dawkins who is sick we pray that you will be to her the great physician even as the earthly physicians attend to her may she even right now experience your presence may she experience your power may she experience your healing and restoration and as you work in her behalf may she give you the glory be Lord with so many others perhaps some standing in front of me right now who are sick oh sweet balm in Gilead may you move even right now throughout this group may you touch individuals bodies may you touch kidneys touch hearts touch blood vessels touch the head touch the body touch your people oh God and grant them the healing that they desire according to your mighty power and your divine will we pray Lord for those who are seeking jobs some have made applications and are waiting on you to work for them work in their favor we place their cases before you for you are a God you are not only concerned about our spiritual experience but you are concerned about every aspect of our lives and so we pray for your intervention we pray for somebody who may be having a family problem who may be experiencing emotional issue who may still be hurting as a result of a loss of a loved one or whatever the issue is we may not know now but you oh God you know we pray oh great deliverer that that you will give somebody a breakthrough even as they stand by the altar today and so we commend every sister into your hands we commend every brother we commend every youth we commend every husband every wife every family member we commend Glendevon Church into your hands and your people who come to Zion to worship you. May we experience your power. May we experience your blessing. May we see the results, O oh Lord, and may we give you the glory. Grant us a spiritual revival even now and so that on that day when you shall come, may we, standing before you, worshiping you now, along with those whom we shall impact today may we all have the privilege and the joy of having a part in your eternal kingdom thank you now lord for hearing and for answering our prayers for we ask these mercies in the mighty name of jesus and let the church of god say amen and amen god bless you please return to your seats touching jesus is all that really matters abraham believed all he promised noah had the faith to 
build an ark. Elijah called the fire down from heaven. Daniel trusted God with all his heart. Moses led God's children out of Egypt, following the one who knows the way. Peter had the courage to start walking, and just like them, I'm stepping out in faith. I'm stepping out in faith. I'm walking on the water, trusting in the Father, knowing He'll be with me all the way. I'm stepping out in faith. The winds will blow against me. I will claim the victory. Resting in His all-sufficient grace. I'm stepping out, stepping out in faith. Oh, I don't have to fear what comes tomorrow or know exactly what the future holds. For the God of all creation goes before me And I can rest assured he's in control So I'll just keep on walking on this journey Following the one who knows the way And though sometimes my faith may start to waver I'll take a leap, I'm stepping out in faith I'm stepping out in faith Walking on the water, trusting in the Father, knowing He'll be with me all the way. I'm stepping out in faith, the winds will blow against me. I will claim the victory, resting in His all sufficient grace. I'm stepping out, stepping out in faith. I'm stepping out in faith, I'm walking on the water. Trusting in the Father, knowing He'll be with me all the way. I'm stepping out in faith, the winds will blow against me. I will claim the victory, resting in His all sufficient grace. I'm stepping out, stepping out in faith. I'm walking on the water, trusting in the Father, the winds will blow against me. I will claim the victory. I'm walking on the water, trusting in the Father, knowing He'll be with me all the way. I'm stepping out, stepping out in faith, in
boys and girls. It's time for us to listen to our children as they share their Sabbath school lessons. Tanique Reed will present the kindergarten lesson and Diana Taylor will present the primary lesson, both from the SDA Church, George's Valley. Quincy Webb from the SDA Church, Darlistan, will present the PowerPoint lesson. We always learn important life lessons from the children's story with Grandma and Keith. This week will be no different. So please don't go anywhere. After the lesson reviews, Jesse Bins from the SDA Church March Town will introduce the speaker. Happy Sabbath, everyone. The topic of the kindergarten lesson is Lot Chose First. The memory verse is let not have any quarreling between you and me. Genesis 13, verse 8. The message is, God's people put others first. The summary of the lesson is, in Christian communities, there, there are problems and challenges to face. But the story helps us to know that we can settle problems fairly without quarreling. Happy Sabbath, everyone. The primary lesson is, Jesus makes new friends. The memory verse is, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Matthew 9, verse 13. The message is, God invites everyone to join his family. The summary is, when Jesus lived on this earth, he spent time with social outcasts and sinners. As his followers, we are we are called to follow his examples by being friendly to everyone so that we might help some learn of Jesus. The topic of the PowerPoint lesson is God invites everyone to join his family. The politics is now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. John 13, 14, and 15. The PowerPoint, we share God's love with others when we serve them. Summary of the lesson, we can share God's love with others by doing servant-like acts for our family, friends, and neighbors. When we share God's love with others through acts of kindness, when we are serving the Lord. I wonder where is Keith? Grandma, Keith! Grandma! Grandma! I heard, grandma. Grandma. I heard some lovely voice. Come over here. Look here. I am looking for Keith. Have, do, have you seen Keith? No, we haven't. But I'm pretty sure he's probably out with the other children today. Doing what? Grandma, didn't you know that today is Global Youth Day? Globe and wait, wait. But let me, you guys are looking so lovely. Global what? Global Youth Day. What is that all about? Global Youth Day is sharing the love of Jesus through our youth. We give out packages. Wow. And, and give out water. And also, we give out tracts. Look at that. Look here, I wonder if I can come with you all. Yes, sure. you can. Of course, you can. Anyone can. You can come and support our youth. Look at that. So tell me something, because is it only you all going out? No. no everyone is going out. Everybody? St. James, Jamaica, and the world. Wow. So what going to happen to church? They are going to have a little service in church, then they go on the street? Yes, Grandma. Wow. That must be lovely. And you all are looking so sweet. You're looking, You're looking nice. so sweet, too. I didn't even know that I was dressing like you all. I just picked up this shirt today, you know. Boy, oh boy, I have to come out with you guys. So tell me something, because I know that you came for me, huh? Yes, Grandma. So what are you going to do for me now? Because you're all looking lovely, because we need to, you know, feel energetic as we go out, huh? Yes, Grandma, we can sing a chorus for you. What? Wow, let me hear it because you all are looking so lovely. Let me see how it, go ahead. We are marching in the light of God. 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 We are marching, we are marching, we are marching. Oh, we are marching in the light of God. We are marching. 
I want to dance. Guys, you have such lovely voices. Listen, you guys must stay in the church, you hear? Yes, girl. Don't go anywhere because what? When you stay in the church and stay with God, your future is very, very bright, okay? Listen, I'm going to go for my handbag, but I have to talk to some boys and girls as well. So remember, just keep working for the Lord. You can't wait for me in the living room, okay? Yes, girl. Bye, Bye girl. sweetie. Bye. They're looking so lovely. Let me go and talk to my boys and girls so they too can go out on the mission field. Boys and girls, what a joy it is. Today, Global Youth Day and Children's Day, that we all can go out. And here in West Jamaica Conference, we're having services from 9.15 to 10.30, and then everybody will be going out. What a thing it is, because we are going to be impacting the cities Boy, I tell you, we are on the march for Jesus. So boys and girls, bigger boys and girls, if you are not ready to go, it's time for you to take up your bag and go on the street because we must show up in the city. God bless you, boys and girls. Good morning and happy Sabbath to you all. The privilege is mine to introduce our speaker for today. She is a 15-year-old third form student at the Harrison Memorial High School and also a member of the King's Seventh-day Adventist Church where she is a pathfinder and presently serves as one of the AY secretaries. Our speaker is a trained child preacher and seizes every opportunity to represent Christ in whatever she does. Caring, assertive, and passionate about the well-being of others are just a few adjectives to describe her. I present to you Sister Gabrielle Watson. Whisper a prayer for her as she comes to present the word to us. But before she comes, Nathan Laws from South SDA Church will do the song of meditation. Great unknown, where feet may fail, and there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. So I will call upon your name. And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours, and you are mine Grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. When feet may fail and fear surround me, you've never failed and you won't start now. So I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace 
for I am yours, and you are mine. Spirit, lead me where my trust is with the borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is with the borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. So I will call upon your name. And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you are Sabbath, my brothers and sisters. It is a pleasure to be your speaker for this morning. I must say thank you to Nathan Laws from South for that wonderful song of meditation, and also to Jesse Bins from Marchtown for that kind words of introduction. The theme we are focusing on for this morning is children preparing for eternity. Children are an heritage to the Lord. We too have our part to play in this part of this vineyard. As we prepare for eternity, let us pray. Most righteous and heavenly Father, as I come to you this morning to present your word, please help me to reflect on the word properly. Thank you for everything you have done for us. Please open the hearts and the minds of those who may listen. Please forgive us of our sins, known and unknown. In your name I pray, amen. How can we prepare for eternity? We are a powerful generation only when we are passionate about Jesus. We are an army equipped for service, guided by the power of the Holy Spirit. I am impressed by David as a young lad, how he conquered Goliath with his slingshot and a stone. However, in reality, he conquered him with true faith in the true God as children, young people, and adults in the congregation. You also face real battles. The giants are real. The threats are real. Our faith and our spiritual ammunition should also be real. Firstly, as children on the path to eternity, we have to know how to talk to God as a friend. We must learn how to pray, just like David in Psalms 23, 91 and 51. Let us cry out to God. Do not face the giant without having spent time with him. Secondly, what should be the priority of every Adventist children, young man and young woman? the same as David was. May God be exalted. May those who come in contact with us know that there is a God of love whom we serve. May we honor God and glorify him in every act of, of our lives. The priority is God and God alone. Thirdly, there is nothing more beautiful than children and young persons obsessed with service to God and to others. 
young people distributing tracts, sharing a sandwich, being helpful to someone in need, passionate to do all that brings honor and glorify to God. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus made a promise that he would come again in order for us to meet him and go where he has promised to prepare. We have to stand tall with him. We have to study his words. We have to commune with him. We have to live right. We have to allow our lights to shine in this dark world. Children, young people, adults, let us all get ready for Jesus' sec for Jesus' second coming. For Jesus' second coming. Prepare to meet thy God. Amen. Amen. What a beautiful sermon that was. And we thank our children for really taking part today. And as you see us in our t-shirts, yes, we are going on the road. And this is a shirt that we'll be wearing to go impact the cities, to go impact our community. So yes, Craig, I see you. You don't know why we are wearing our t-shirts. That's why we are in our t-shirts. Because indeed, we want to evangelize for Jesus. So if you want to say, yes, you want to come and evangelize with us, tell others, just put in the chat, city because we are going into the city. Let us continue to pray for our young people because we know they are doing a great and mighty work for Jesus. Let us pray. Father, which art in heaven, I just want to thank you for what you have done for us. We thank you for calling us. Thank you for our young people. And as we are going out on the streets to go and impact the communities, I pray that you will let everyone see the importance of going out to tell their neighbors, their friends, and their family members about Jesus. And I thank you that we could be streaming so others can be watching and help us always to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. We, the children from across the West Jamaica Conference, are grateful for the invitation to participate in the WJC online program. Thank you to Sister Smite James for giving us this opportunity to be of service to the Lord. We also value the excellent job done by the production team. We are grateful to all of you who tuned in on Facebook, YouTube, WCCN, Bless TV, and all the other social media platforms, as well as our live audience. I was your host, Jordana Harvey, and we are children preparing for eternity. Goodbye for now. Sleep is gone, my heart is full of sorrow. I can't believe how much I've let you down, but I dread the pain that waits for me tomorrow. tomorrow. The sun reveals my broken dreams scattered on the ground please forgive me I need your grace to make it through all I have is you I'm at your mercy Lord I will serve you until my dad
Amen. Happy Sabbath, family. I know I may not look the part, but I'm sure you've been hearing from morning that today is a special Sabbath day. It is Global Youth Day. And so, while I may not be dressed the part, I hope we are all excited to share the good news of our risen Lord and Savior with the world. This Sabbath, like all Sabbaths, we have an excited uh, group of young people ready to share with you the beautiful insights that we would have gained from studying the lesson this week. We've been taking a look at Jesus and Liberty throughout this quarter, and this Sabbath we're taking some time to look at the final tyranny. So the young people I have sharing with us this morning, on my left, Sister Shanika Wilson. Happy Sabbath, Sister Wilson. Happy Sabbath. And to my right, Sister Christina Campbell. Happy Sabbath, sis. Happy Sabbath, everyone. And I am your host for this morning, Brother Brandon Gilbert. So to get us started this morning, Shanika, would you mind praying for us? All right. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here in your courts to worship. As it is custom, allow your Holy Spirit to be with us as we are about to discuss your word. Allow hearts to be blessed. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the final tyranny is what we're spending some time focusing on this morning. And to kind of lay the framework for what we'll be talking about, I invite you to turn to Revelation chapter 13. And we'll be taking a look at verses 11 to 15. And it reads, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword. And they live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now we know our friends on YouTube and Facebook are always listening in. So I have a question for you this morning. To our friends over on Facebook, how are the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation relevant to our daily lives? Again, how are the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation relevant to our daily lives? And to our friends on YouTube, why should young people care about the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation? Again, why should young people care about the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation? Now, Christina, Matthew 24, 24, what were your thoughts as you took a look at that verse this week? As Matthew 24, verse 24 says, For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. This scripture on a practical level is warning us and telling us to be to beware and we should discern because a lot of false or even fake preachers will come along performing miracles, as they know that we as people, we are sometimes easily swooned by what we would see. We are being warned not to be fooled. We have to know the things for ourselves that we aren't easily led away. Amen. So when the Bible calls us to study to show ourselves approved, it is an important instruction so that we'd be sober and vigilant. And think about it. How many Sabbath school lessons and Bible studies have we had on the important truths of Daniel and Revelation? But how purposeful are we in our own time with God being informed on these very important subject matters? Now, Sister Shanika, in, in Genesis week, we took a look at Earth's final superpower. What did you find there? 
All right, so Earth's final superpower. This is in reference to the power in which the nation symbolically seen rising from the earth will have in executing religio-political tyranny in the last days. Now, Revelation 13, verse 11, this precedes the beast which was seen coming from the sea who had received the deadly wound. And the historical timeline for this deadly wound is in 1798 when Napoleon arrested Pope Pius IV. It stated that there will come another coming from the earth which is symbolizing its uprising power from an area of the world deemed sparsely populated. With these information, Bible prophecy, plus historical data, we are able to pinpoint this beast or kingdom or nation to North America. The danger of this nation lies in its deceptive disguise. It was described to have two horns like a lamb, symbolizing having a godlike appearance, but it spoke as a dragon. This kingdom or beast will pose as a great threat to God's people because it will. And notice that I say will because we are currently in this prophecy, so there are things that have not been fulfilled as yet. So this beast will have global influence and power to unite religious political forces in executing the same agenda as the previous nation which came from the sea to lead the world in false worship and tyranny. And this section of the lesson wanted to remind us that let not our hearts be troubled. With all of this that will be happening, God will still have his people who will stand for him, comes what me. Amen. Powerfully said. And I see some responses from our friends on YouTube. I see Sapphire Bailey saying the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation are being fulfilled right before our eyes. And Ophelia says the signs are all around us. We are in the last days. The lamb-like beast is currently working. And so, Christina, interpret a religious movement. What were your thoughts? My thoughts on the religious movement. The signs that would have been portrayed by the earthly beast when studied would be false outpouring of the Holy Spirit, false miracles, and also deception. This earthly beast will come presenting wrong to make it look right and entertaining. But we, with the spirit of discernment, we will be able to differentiate the truth from lies. It will enable us to not be deceived. And we will have to know what we stand for as people and as believers. Hence the scripture, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Amen. And you know, when you think back to the time of the disciples, you know, Jesus was very careful in the words that he shared. You know, he commented that the people at the time were so hungry for signs. They wanted evidence with their eyes. And when you think about it, how different will it be at the time of the last days where you'll have these false movements working, these signs and wonders, like as we read in Matthew 24, 24, that if we aren't informed, we run the risk of being deceived. And so the caution still stands true for us today. Are we taking the time to search the scriptures to see what the Bible truly says? Now, Shanika, lamb-like. I see in Revelation 13, verse 8, and Revelation 13, 11, a difference between a lamb and a lamb-like beast. What are your thoughts? Well, when John saw Jesus walking towards him, he declared, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The lamb referred to in Revelation 13, verse 8, is the same lamb that was wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. He, this lamb was slain to set us free. And it's through this lamb in Revelation 13, verse 8, that we will have life and be saved. Now, the lamb referred in Revelation 13, verse 11, it's not a lamb. The, the, right, and, the right title belongs to Jesus. This is a lamb-like, and it's none other than the North America working under the influence of the great deceiver, the dragon, Satan. Amen. And we're seeing some more responses from our friends over on YouTube. I see Britannia Hunter saying, so we young people can be firm in the word of God, have a strong connection with God, 
and no one can mislead us. And to my fellow members on the panel, I have a similar question as we pose to the ones on YouTube, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it as well. Why should young people care about the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation? Shanika, we can start with you. All right, so we were focusing on Revelation 13, verse 11 for this week. And while reading in verse, is it 16? It stated that the war that is happening between good and evil, the rich and the poor is not excluded. The young and the old is not excluded. So as young people, we need to know exactly where we stand in this war. If we don't, most likely you're going to, you can't be in the middle. Because a lot of young persons, they don't want to be politically affiliated. They don't want to be affiliated with any religion. But this, this prophecy is telling us that you will have to be affiliated with either God or the devil. So it's for us to study the word so that we can be on the winning side. Because I know a lot of young people love to win. Yes, and we love life. We don't like destruction. We want to live forever. We want to experience that goodness of God. Amen. And I see a comment by Sister Ophelia in the chat reminding us that we need to call the scripture for what it really is. And so when the Bible calls us to point out these signs and symbols in, symbols in the word of God, where the papal power, the Catholic system, will have a role in these last days, where we see evidence in scripture, where the powers at work in America will have a role in these last days, we as people of God have to be equipped with the truth in such a way where we're able to ex explain the amazing truths and prophecies so that the people of the world can be aware of what will come. Now, Sister Christina, what were your thoughts on that? Young people, why should we know the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation? Okay, so we as young people, we have to know, we have to study because it will be our tools for when the real thing presents itself. We, once again, we have to stand for what we stand for. And as Shanika would have said, we won't be exempt. Just because we're young, we probably think that, okay, this won't reach us. But more than likely, we as young people might get the most attacked because we're young. And a lot of times we don't know our stuff in depth. So we have to study and use that as our tools. Amen. And I'm seeing that Sister Polly in the chat wants a little clarification. So the Bible does point to the fact that America, not the continent of North America, but the United States of America will have a role to play in these last days in enforcing the system that will force worship. And, you know, for the past few weeks, we've been talking about this idea of religious liberty. Why do you worship? You know, back in the room when we were discussing it, you know, we were thinking a lot of times when we grow up in the church, we simply inherit our religion. But especially in these last days, we have to be purposeful in our individual time with God to discover why do I worship God? What are the truths that I hold there? Do I hold them there simply because my mom did and the generations before did? But has the Holy Spirit led me to be convicted of the amazing truths in the word of God? And so even as we allow these thoughts to you know, run around in our mind, a lot of times we leave them in that theoretical realm where we say, all right, yeah, that's what prophecy means and we expect it to happen. But the truth of the matter is, this isn't simply a far off truth anymore. For those living in these last days, we can see the evidence around us. We can see already at work the papal system and the American system holding hands in such a way that fast approaching is a time where religious liberty will be attacked, where we will have to, like the three Hebrew boys say, despite the laws of the land, we will stand up for the principles of godliness. And therefore, people of God, we must know for ourselves what that truth really is. And so from our inverse friends here over in West Jamaica Conference, we encourage you to continue to study to show yourself approved. Continue to talk to God and ask God, God, what would you have me know in your beautiful truths? And having informed me, help me to be equipped and empowered to share that truth with the world. And so as we close out this Sabbath, continue to read out the word of God and continue to share that with your friends, family. And to close us off, Sister Christina, would you mind praying for us? Let us pray. Dear kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for this study that we would have done throughout the course of this week and throughout the duration of this quarter. We pray that as these times draw near, that you will help us to be equipped and we will not be deceived. 
Help us to be able to share the truth that we know with our friends and with our families so they can be saved as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus, you know, if you're looking below, it's worse to know them. Pushing and shouting, it's crowded my mind. So for my sake, teach me to take. Just give me the strength to do every day what I have to do.
to this segment. It's the 14 parishes and the diaspora in praise, prayer, testimony, and thanksgiving. And before we get to all of that, we want you to know that Acts 1 and verse 8 says, Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So, we are dressed this morning. The church says, show up in the city. So, we are hitting the cities today with the good news that Jesus is coming. So, wherever in the world you are, go and tell someone. Send the link, whether you are in Africa or Asia, Jamaica or the Caribbean, the Americas, <laughs> and the Comara, Europe. Europe and Oceania. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Let's get the word <laughs> out that the Lord is coming and the cities need to know. Well, not just the cities, but everywhere else in between. So I have a thanksgiving and a praise. Well, my father is in the hospital now, but before he got there Saturday night, He's on continuous oxygen. And the oxygen finished. And we, you know, places closed in the night, so we couldn't get any. And the Lord provided in a miraculous way. I didn't ask his permission, so I won't call his name. But his relative also got ill Saturday night and had to be hospitalized. And he said he wouldn't be able to supply me with the oxygen. But if I want an oxygen concentrator, I could get it to borrow till Monday. And praise the Lord, Amen. my father was able to be on oxygen until Tuesday. When I called him Monday, he said he didn't need it because she was still in hospital. So we continue to pray for his relative. My father is stable now, and we are just praising the Lord. Of course, my mother is in the house because she goes to see him during visiting hours. So we praise the Lord, and we give him thanks. It's over to you, Denny. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. And as we are on the theme about going out into the cities and the byways and the highways, let us not become complacent in our own circle, but recognize that God has truly given us a mission, a, a work to do, to preach this word to every kindred tongue and people. And that is the great gospel commission that we ought to be getting out there. Don't become complacent in your own circles, but get up, let's go and move for Christ. And also on the, the matter of birthdays, yes. I'd like to say happy belated birthday to Simonique Forrester. Yes, little Simonique. She celebrated her birthday yesterday. And we just want you to know, Simonique, that we love you, we adore you, and continue to grow in Christ. Also, Norman Arnold is celebrating his birthday today. So, Norman, I know, I know Kadisha and Anne-Marie is going to make it very special for you. So, we wish you a happy um, birthday indeed. And it's a good day when you celebrate your birthday on the Sabbath day. Over to Satch. Oh, yes. Uh, happy belated birthday to my mommy dearest, Miss Prim Prim as she's affectionately called Primrose. Pauline, we say happy birthday to you. <laughs> happy belated birthday to you, mommy. I know you have had a good one. And if I can just be as easygoing as you are, I know my life would improve drastically. That's still something I'm, I mean, I'm very easygoing, you know, but I'm still working on it. I can do better. So happy belated to you, mommy. And uh, Angie, Angela Heath, uh, Renee's and Renisa's mommy, Pyros Bunononos, over there in Hampton. She also celebrated her birthday, March 14. We say happy belated birthday to you from me and the rest of your family. Yannick Beckford Glenise celebrated her birthday as well on Thursday. And for those of you in the chat who have been praying for Craig's father, we all know Elder Craig Hall in the chat. His father wasn't so well, and you've been praying. He thanks you for the prayers. And also, his dad, Raymond Hall, celebrated his birthday on Wednesday. So in addition to your prayers and your concerns, we're just going to ask you to type, Happy birthday to Raymond. Happy belated birthday to Raymond in the chat. And on the issue of Acts 18, well, Acts 1 verse 8. 
it's a great reminder to us of the power of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's where we are empowered to be witnesses, not just locally or among ourselves, but globally by spreading the message of hope and salvation to the ends of the earth. And as we always remind you to be the digital disciple, in doing that, you are able to help us to spread the gospel globally. Happy yeah. Global Youth Day. Amen. And it's over to Camaro. Thank you, Sister Popkin. And the birthday greetings continue to my friend, Elder Edward Cully, who will be celebrating his birthday March 18th. I am of the view that the best people come from, you know, are born in the month of March, don't it? Right? Thank you, Sister Popkin and April, of course. And October, no, March. <laughs> so happy birthday, my friend. When it comes, I know it will be very special for you. And to my cousin, Dario Morgan, who celebrated his birthday this week, I also know that you enjoyed your birthday. Cause long time I not see you, but I know you are okay. May God continue to bless you. To Tashana James, a talented young lady, happy belated birthday to you. And Sister Jean Bender, you were praying for her last week as she did her surgery. Well, the family wants you to know that she came through that surgery successfully and is thanking you for praying for her. Continue to do so. And as it relates to our text, we are witnesses, yes. The Bible also reminds us that we are the light of the world. Let us be the light that help others to see Happy Youth Day, Global Youth Day, everyone. May God continue to bless you tremendously. Thank you. And a belated birthday to Maureen Robinson at the Marchstone Preparatory School. She celebrated yesterday. She is a tremendous gift to those children. And of course, Mariah, we're talking to you directly today. The Lord has laid his hand on your heart. <laughs> And you are responding, and his arms are just open to welcome you back. And of course, that's who Moriah from Hampton Court. That's Seventh right. Adventist. And so, don't allow the enemy to deter you, because God didn't spare his son, but gave him for your salvation, for our salvation. Therefore, nothing but nothing can separate you from the love of God. We will be praying especially for you now, for the Sharon Morris celebrated and the students who will be doing exams, March 20. Join us as we lift these matters to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we are so privileged to call you Father. We praise you and we bless your name. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. We know that anything matters to us it matters to you so we rejoice with those who have had milestones whether it be birthdays recoveries like Craig Hall's father and those who are celebrating your goodness in other ways we thank you and we praise you we thank you for your Holy Spirit speaking to Mariah and for the way she has been responding Heavenly Father She's watching and listening now, and she's also listening to the Holy Spirit. But we also know that the enemy continues to batter, to, to hammer at her that she's not worthy. Heavenly Father, she will never be worthy, but Jesus is worthy. He has already paid the price, and that's all she needs to claim the merits of Jesus' blood for her. So, Heavenly Father, may you apply to her heart. May you cleanse her. May you wrap her in your robe of righteousness. And may you surround her with your holy angels to defeat the evil one. We pray, Lord, that she will allow you to hold her hand. Because at this time, she is too feeble to hold yours. Hold her and keep her by your side. Then we pray for those who are still struggling with illnesses that brother who so graciously allowed us to use his oxygen concentrator. We pray for his relative that you will continue to not just stabilize her, but to recover her of her illness. And for the others who are ill, whether at home or in hospital, we pray that your grace, your healing hands will be there according to your mercies. 
For those who will be writing exams, particularly the PEP, March 20 and 21, we pray, Heavenly Father, that as they continue to prepare, your Holy Spirit will be with them to rivet those in bits of information that they will need most to be successful. Above all, we pray that they will mindful to prepare themselves for that all-time exam of beings before the judgment bar. May they be found worthy to be admitted into eternal life with you. To this end, we commit ourselves and thank you for hearing and for answering our prayers for Jesus' sake. Amen. Sounds lovely. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is excellent. God is good. And so this morning we're going to do our praise and worship segment. We invite you to tune your voices and hearts with us as we go to thank you for the cross, Lord. That's it. Great. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing Yeah. 
hearts be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I found in you. Lord, I've come to know I see. Thank you very much. Happy Sabbath to you, everybody. Those in-house and those online, we welcome you to the participatory aspect of our worship. And um, I'd like to say a few things. One, uh, Brother Vern, when I say the prayer for the offering, I want you to join me in saying prayer for our PEP students. PEP, for those of us who are not Jamaicans, is the exam that the children do to move from the primary to the secondary level. And it comes in installments, and in the coming week, they will be sitting one installment, and so we want to pray for them. Now, worship is giving. Put another way, it is an attitude of gratitude. It is personal, sacrificial, and self-denial commitment to support what God is doing through the church. Stewardship is about responsibility and something that responsibility of something that is not yours. And I told you repeatedly that the fact is you are not even your own. Larry Burkett, in reflecting on our stewardship responsibility, says that stewardship is not optional. And he gives us some recommendations. One, take control of your finances back from advertisers. Two, Burkitt says, regulate your expenditures. Three, keep these three in proper perspective and juxtaposition. Number one, your earning. Two, your savings. And three, your spending. Because if your outflow exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. Not only that, 
but basic management of your money is critical in stewardship. As we come to worship today, I want to give you three terms I want you to take with you. Number one is AI. AI minus T and T equals NSI. AI is your available income. And the principle is you cannot spend or contract more than you earn in order to spend your available income. Secondly, your T and T is your taxes and your tithe. One to the government, what, the, what the, the, the people are expecting, and two is to God. NSI is not spending, is your net spending income. So the principle is pay your debt, pay yourself, and support God's work. As you come today, we pray that God will give you a heart of liberality, that God will give you a heart of gratitude, so as he has blessed you, you will bless his work. The giving options are running on the screen, and we ask you to act appropriately in gratitude and response to God's blessings. Father, thank you for jobs. Thank you for maturing investments. Thank you for savings. Thank you for the charity and liberality of our offsprings and our relatives and our friends and those who are considerate. We pray that as we receive, that we will give so that the chain will not be broken where we stand. We lift up our students who will sit pep in the coming week. We are stewards of their welfare and well-being. Thank you for the teachers who prepare them. Thank you for the schools that nurture them. And as we send them off on a springboard that will catapult them into their future, we pray that you will give them wisdom and give them retention, give them analytical skills, and help that they will succeed so that we will rise up to call them blessed. Bless those who give today. Bless those who always give. And thank you for being the premier giver of your son and salvation. Take us and take our gifts today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue our worship service, we are grateful for your presence with us. We welcome you online and we welcome those in the physical space. And if Pastor Ronnie Henry is here, we welcome you especially. Today we will join the program at Santa Cruz where Footprints 4 is on. And Pastor Glenn Samuels will speak today. He is the evangelist in that series. We thank God for his ministry. You know, Pastor Samuels is president of the West Jamaica Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And of course, he is married with two, three adult children and an expanding family. And we thank God for their ministry. We ask you to send the link if you haven't yet done so and pray that someone will be recommitted and others will recommit will commit to god today because of this ministry the anointed ones currently are doing the song of meditation and thereafter please give your hearts to the holy spirit and your attention as he speaks through pastor glenn samuels to kill Not fit to kill. But then a man. 
you not fit to kill. Yeah. But then the man on the cross, he put me in his will and said that I could steal for What a song, what a message, what a, uh, we, we could have the benediction right here and go home. That's the gospel, that's the gospel in its, in its full glory. Tell me what kind of a man, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is good to be in the presence of the Lord God. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for us to dwell together in his presence. I welcome you with the love of Jesus. I welcome you with the warmth of Christian fellowship. Are you listening to me? Would you put your hands together as we welcome our union president, our brother and friend, the leader of the church in Jamaica, a hard-working president. I wouldn't tell you that Thursday we almost work him to death, huh? from Kingston to Mandeville to Kingston to Montego Bay to Spanish Town, and he's here again today. For the President, we welcome you, and we uh, thank you for gracing us with your presence today. It is my joy to welcome everyone, and my, I just want quickly, quickly, 
I have two special Bibles. They're still in their box. They're still in cover. They're still in plastic. I'm saying I have two special Bibles that I want to give to two special persons. The first man, the first man who will come right up. You're planning to be baptized today, and you'll be right up here. The, the first man who will come right up here today, you're planning to be baptized and you're sure you're going to be baptized, and you're the first man. <laughs> well, well, well. The, the last time I checked, the Lord made them male and female. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Well, well, you're going to have to open. There's a box under there. If you open, because I, I was going to say the first man and the first woman. So, so let me... Can you bring two for me? Uh, uh, that young man is bold and brave and happy in the Lord. Huh? I, when I grow up, I want to be just like him. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. And uh, if you're planning on being baptized, we try to reserve some seats for you. And I still have a few left down here. And, um, but I noticed he ran back. I guess he ran back to sit with his mother. Uh, okay. He ran back to sit with his mother. If you're down there and uh, today is your baptism, as well it should be, uh, I want you to be seated right down front. So, yes, I see somebody else coming. So, let me invite other candidates who are seated elsewhere in the congregation. I want to look in your face. I want to be able to, to see your face a little clearer. So, if you just come right down front and uh, exchange a seat right down front right here. Come right over and sit anywhere right here. So if you're coming, come quickly. Our time is running from us and um, we want to be sure that you are all comfortably seated. If you're sitting anywhere else, if you're outside especially, come right in. We have seats for you. So again, thank you very quickly for our candidates. We want you to be seated right down front. And uh, let me ask our Bible counselors. Let me ask our Bible counselors if you to be busy now. You need to be walking around the tent to make sure that you help the candidates to be in their respective seats. I see uh, some more coming. Come right down, sweetie. Come right down. Come right down, sir. And um, we have seats right here for you again. Uh, while they're coming. We want them to be seated right down front. And I see some more coming. If you're seated anywhere else, we're going to ask you to come and take your seat right in these chairs that are reserved for you. Uh, I told you last night, I told you on Wednesday, there's a gentleman who was watching online and he decided to fly down to Santa Cruz. He is somewhere here today. He is somewhere. He is somewhere here. Uh, Sir Felix... I hope I didn't get the name wrong. I know he's here. I, I saw his car this morning. I am not sure if he's sitting in his car or sitting someplace, but um, I'm going to ask if my pastor or, or the elder who showed me the card, if you could invite him and escort him to the reserve seated area. So again, if you're planning on being baptized, there's, we have still some seats right here for you. We're asking the Bible counselors to, to try to make sure that we get uh, our candidates. So Bible counselors, please walk around the tent. We want to make sure that at the appropriate time, we can move them to the buses. We were hoping to have the buses parked close enough, but there's so many cars, and we're so glad to have you all here today. So I, I did for the, for the maids, and I want to thank, I want to thank my friend, I have a very special friend who paid for four boxes of Bibles, Pastor Brown. And, I, and if I say our special friend, I'm sure that I won't have to say anything else and you'll know who, who it is. And so let me go now. You, the first female, you don't have a Bible and you're going to get baptized today. Uh, you don't have a Bible. You're a female and you're getting baptized today. Well, I want to put a Bible in your hand. I want to put a Bible. Here comes one with a broad smile, a broad all right. Is there any other female getting baptized today and you don't have a Bible? You're getting baptized today and you don't have a Bible. 
Well, I see two coming. Now, come on, sweetheart. Come on, come on, come on. Don't turn back. Don't. You must never turn back. Come on, come on, come on. Never turn back. Never be discouraged. Never be. All righty. Okay. Would you put your hands together for them? Beautiful. And I, I see my friend, uh, Sir Carl Powell and, 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 and Joan, and if I start calling names, and I have a friend, uh, I almost would have ordered a casket for Byron, except Byron should have joined us already, he was a Bible worker, and the only reason he's getting away, he lost his brother uh, in the process. And um, we, we're still have, happy to have you uh, standing with us today, and we extend our condolences to you and your family at the loss of your brother. But as soon as you bury him, you're coming up here. Okay. But the president, I, if I can't preach today, I'm going to blame two of my sisters-in-law and my wife. I, I, I got up this morning and, um, you know, I, all week I worked on a text and an, and an idea. And I left you last night, and I sat up and, you know, fine-tuned and brush up and stuff. But then this morning, the Lord emailed me another script. And it disturbed my mind because I couldn't focus as fast as he was downloading the stuff in my mind. And so I sat at the table, and uh, uh, Ursella brought out oranges and ripe banana and stuff and then Sir Sella brought out more ripe banana and fruits and papaya and then Der Sella brought out more so if I can't preach today don't blame me blame all the sellers uh, 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 two sisters-in-law and one wife and then one daughter plus tax I said one daughter plus tax uh, okay. <laughs> president said he loves the tax uh, uh, one daughter plus tax came and was, uh, she came to add some more to it. And um, so don't blame me. But when my wife looked at me uh, and said, but dear, now if I tell you a story, you would know what you said to me. So, so the preacher was preaching and um, he noticed in the vast congregation, just like this one, there's only one person who was crying. And he said, Thank you, Lord, at least the sermon has reached one soul. And so he was waiting for the end of the service to ask this one soul what part of the sermon was most meaningful to her. And so as the congregation was filing out, he's looking for who? That one person who was crying. And they kept coming down, he's looking for one person. And finally, the one person came, Thompson, and he said, oh, sister, it's wonderful to see you. Can you tell me what part of the sermon was such a blessing to you uh, and she said in her country style it, it is not the sermon you know pastor but but i worked so hard to, to grow one ram goat and and the old thief them teeth the one ram goat and every time i look for your beard up there i i remember the one ram goat and and uh it is not now I usually make sure there's nothing on my face that could cause you to cry because you've lost some stuff. But my wife said to me, dear, you forgot to shave yesterday. So please, if you've lost your one rum goat, look at Pastor Brown and don't look at me. <laughs> Today, you've been sitting for a while. Would you stand with me as we open the word together. Would you stand, everybody? Would you stand with me? And I'm going to ask you if you have the Bible on your tablet, your iPhone, or, you, or like me, you have the paper edition. And I joke about the old lady who lost the one I said that she advanced so much on in terms of her livelihood. And unexpectedly, it was stolen. I want you to understand that no matter what you lose, no matter what you have to put aside, 
Don't let the devil distract you from the decision you need to make today. No matter how difficult life gets, maybe the job you now hold holds in your mind the secret to your economic success. But maybe that job is standing between you and the decision you need to make today. Whatever you have to let go, allow God to guide you. I battled with a young lady last night who came with joy to meet the preacher. We talked and we prayed together. I know the road is rough and the hills are hard to climb. But you recited a text with me last night. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? I pray the living God that the Holy Ghost will speak and that you will hear his voice. So would you read with me? We're going to St. Luke chapter 15. I'm not changing the topic, but the Lord changed my mind from the text and the outline I had. So let's hear what God has to say to us today. I'd like you to read with me the first two verses. That's Luke 15, 1 and 2. Uh, if you're there, I'm giving you another 30 seconds. I'm going to Luke 15, and while you're going there, at the end of the service, we're going to go down by the river. There's somebody here today, you did not leave your house to be baptized, but God is speaking to you right now, even before I get in the word. The Holy Ghost brought you here. I know there's a battle in your mind. I know there's a war going on, but choose the side of God. Now let's read together Luke 15, 1 and 2. Then all for to hear him. Compl Could you read the last line for me? This man. Could you read it one more time? This man receiveth sinners. Lord God of heaven, this is your word. These are your children. We have come today not to hear from Isilda's boy, but to hear a word from God. This is your moment. I'm just a wretched lump of sinful clay. Now put me aside and in your own mercy, sit down beside us. Stand up in this pulpit for the glory of your name. Defeat the devil for the salvation of lost men and women. Break through in our hearts today for the redemption of those who even up to this moment are halting between two opinions, for the rescuing of backsliders who have been battling with that decision all week. You are God and God alone. Let the Holy Ghost loose in this place today. Walk between the pulpit and the pews. Walk between the rows. Walk around the chairs. Take up residence in this place. Climb down in somebody's heart today. Climb down in somebody's mind today. God, this moment needs more than what a sinful human being can supply. But we put it back in your hands. Have your own way. Do your own thing. And grant great salvation and redemption today is our asking in Jesus' name, and let God's children say, you may be seated in the presence of God. The best robe, the best robe, the best robe. There are occasions that require fine dressing. There are situations where 
the cultural norms dictate a particular kind of outfit. We're familiar with wedding services. We're familiar with long, milky white, flowing bridal attire. We're familiar with, with dressing for banquets and stuff. But there is in our text some troubling issues. The passage begins with an accusation against Jesus. And I'm glad that Jesus is guilty. I said the passage begins with a charge, an accusation against the Son of God. What's the charge, preacher? Simply this, this man. This man can't be our rabbi. This man can't be the son of God because this man is mixing too much with sinners. Not only is he mixing with them, but, but, but he even sits down and he is eating with them. This man receiveth sinners and even eats with them. What was the response of Jesus? Notice, if you will, are commonly referred to as the three parables. He would speak of three lost types in the church and in the society. The story of the lost sheep in the first instance is in the interrogative narrative he merely asked which one of you if you should lose one of your sheep he was talking to a lot who understood the value of the sheep to their economy he was addressing them in the context of their business dealings the second story the second story is even more interesting Although the second story also begins with the interrogative narrative as he outlined, he said, which woman? And I'm fascinated because somewhere I want to take preaching liberty with that piece of the parable. Because unlike the other two, this one was due to the carelessness of the primary person that begins the story. He said, what woman? Now, the sheep was lost because it chose to wander away. The boy was lost because he chose by deliberate action to leave. But the coin was lost because of the carelessness of the one who was supposed to be keeping all ten. I said the one coin was lost because of the carelessness. Notice, if you will, and that's not my preaching stuff, but let me confess, that was where I had pitched my tent all week this week. I pitched my tent all week this week on the lost coin. Forgive me, Lord, that I still am dabbling with a little part of it, but I'll run from it and go to where he sent my mind. Listen to me carefully. Over and over again, the Bible uh, would use the symbol of a woman to represent the church. Over and over again, we are introduced to the issue that throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament, God's Ten Commandments have been highlighted not only for our education, but for our obedience thereto. What I find striking in the story is that the woman, and if I would go back to where my mind was, is supposed to be the custodian. Listen to me as I run fast from that. She lost one coin not on the street, not out in the public world. If the Ten Coins represents the Ten Commandments, 
then the one that was lost was lost right in church. Was lost by the church through the carelessness of religious people. Listen to me carefully. In order to find the coin, the woman, she had to light a lamp in order to find the missing coin. If the Lord allowed me to go where I was going, I would have asked you, if you have lost your obedience to one of God's commandments, the only way to find it is to allow the word to be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. You can't find the missing coin by looking only from your own opinion. Help me, son. To find the missing coin, she had to light a lamp. Listen to me carefully. The modern church is like pretty lamps without light. And the lamp that is pretty becomes an object and not an instrument. Follow me carefully. It's not enough to be a well-dressed Christian. It's not enough to be a good-looking church-attending Christian. We need to make sure that the total will of God aligns with our own mind, or put it another way, that our mind is in line with the comprehensive truth because the Bible says, come on, son, the Bible says all scripture is given by God's inspiration. The Bible says, if you and I keep the whole law and throw away one, we are guilty. The Bible said, the word must be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Listen to me carefully. Why is it then that a lamp with no light is an object and not an instrument. The lamp can have no light coming out of it unless it has some oil flowing into it. Let me say it again. The lamp can have no light going out of it unless it has some oil flowing into it. And I heard a song some long time ago saying, give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning. And the oil there represents the Holy Ghost. What's wrong with the church is that we have religion with no relationship with God. What's wrong with the church, what's wrong with the modern church is that for a while we become content with nine pieces. But since the Lord shifted my mind from there, let me run to where he guided my thoughts. We always talk about the lost boy. But the Lord asked me to tell you that there were two lost sons. One son was lost by actively straying. The other son was lost right in the church. Lost right at home. So hang with the preacher. I want to make four points. And when I get through, I'll say I'm done. Point number one. Both boys lost their best role. Listen to me as we look at the story. We focus always on the younger. The older had the natural hair of getting a double portion of the father's estate. Could it be that the younger son became detached from the father's Estate. Could it be that the younger son became unattached 
disconnected because he was A, neglected by the older brother, or B, is it possible that the daddy was so concerned and focused on the family business that the younger son was drifting but it was never noticed. Nobody ever just get up and leave God like that. There's a drifting that sometimes becomes so imperceptible, unseen by our parents, and sometimes unknown to us young people who have a mindset. Now, I don't know how the younger son got the email about happenings in a far country. I don't know who sent the younger son a text message, but there's something that the text throws in my face. It is this, that slowly he begins to lose his attachment to his father's God. Slowly, he begins to lose his deep, persuasive, passionate commitment to the God of his fathers. And as he begins to lose that, listen to the preacher before the devil can dis... <laughs> listen. You can never be attached to sin unless you are disattached or disconnected from God. You can never be deeply attached to error unless you have been disconnected from Bible. So, young people hear the preacher. If you find yourself losing interest in your father's religion, hear the preacher, God no have no grand picnic. St. John 1 verse 12 said, As many as receive him, to them he gives the power to become the sons of God. Hush your first preacher. What do you mean? It means that you and I, ourselves and our children we've got to know God for ourselves hear me young man hear me young lady your daddy and your mother and your grandparents may be rooted and grounded in the word but if you're going to get to heaven you've got to know God for yourself so, so the young man Listen to what he said to his daddy. Give me the portion of the estate that belonged to me. Everything belonged to the father. And he had no right to it until the death of his daddy. Are you listening to me? But hear me. Whatever the reason for his unattachment to the religion of his father, whatever be the reason for this strange but overwhelming desire to explore in a far country, you know, we've got to go far to sin. Hear the preacher, hear the preacher, and I'm just, I'm just unloading what was downloaded. So, his unattachment to his father's estate, to his father's religion, unknown to him, he somehow failed to understand it is not just that his daddy's rules was getting on his case. It is not just that he was getting tired of his father's restriction. It is not just that 
parental values was losing value to him, the truth was the devil was using that which he was being drawn to to cut him off from that which gives him true life. Walk with the preacher. The daddy didn't sell the land because the boy had no, no, no connection with it. So the daddy had then to value, hear me carefully, the daddy placed a value on the property and then gave some of the value to the son even though the son was going in a far country the daddy gave him some of the family value so he left home with four t's he left home with some of the treasure given to him by his daddy he left home with the talents he developed in his father's home. He left home, what did I say first? With a treasure. He left home with some talents. Listen to me carefully. He left home with four T's. He's got time given to him by God. He does not know how long that time will last. But he can't blame, blame God that God never gave him time. And the truth is, all of us have the same 60 minutes. All of us have the same 24 hours. All of us have the same 7 days to our week. Wherever around the world you go, the black man's week have seven days. The white man's week have seven days. The rich man's hour have the same 60 minutes. The rich man's minute have the same 60 seconds. God is an equal opportunity giver. We all have the same 24 hours to our day. We all have the same seven days to our week. So when God asks you to find some time for worship and you said, I don't have time, it means that you and I have chosen not to give God some of what he has already given us. When God says to us, six days shall thou labor, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And we say, God, I'm too busy. You've got to understand he's given you six for yourself. And then you're robbing him of the one he asked you out of your love for him to give him in sacred worship. Are you listening to me? So the boy left home with his treasure, his talent, his time. And from all indication, he left home with a healthy temple. But somehow, he got tired of home restrictions. Young people, we love unfettered freedom. Mm? Unfettered freedom is always deadly. Are you listening to me? The story is fascinating. The Bible says he left and there's something you may have missed when he said to the father give me what is mine. There's something in the text I want to draw your attention to. The father divided his goods among them it was the younger boy who said give me what is mine but the text said the father gave them both listen to me carefully 
You and I have been blessed by God to be exposed to the truth of the living God in the church of the living God. But walk with the story, walk with the story. I'm in, I'm running fast. I'm in, I'm in verse 19, is it? Or no, no, I'm in verse 12. The younger of them said to his father, give me the portion of good that falleth to me. He divided among them his livelihood. Not many days after, the younger son gathered together all that he had and journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possession with prodigal living. Your King James said boisterous living. One translation says prostitution like living. The first point I want you not to miss is that both boys lost their best robes. I'll come to that at the end. But here my second point. The younger son, I told you before, developed some detachment from the religion that the family had gotten used to. Adam was made by the hand of God, given commandments by God, given the estate of holy matrimony, given the Sabbath of the Lord God, given fruits and nuts and vegetables. And when God brought the flood, he allowed man to eat clean meat. Are you listening to me? And the Bible said that our body is the temple of the Lord God. And he said, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So if your detachment from the religion of the Bible is exposing you to drinking alcohol and eating unclean foods, you may feel you have unfettered freedom, but that's slavery in the making. Why do you think some folk got addicted to alcohol, addicted to stuff, addicted to drugs? They thought they had unfettered freedom follow the preacher the Bible said the young man gathered all of his stuff and he journeyed to a far country and the text and forgive me for cutting some stuff out but when he had spent all there arose a severe famine and he began to be in want. There's nothing as sad as a young man, a young lady, a grown man, a grown woman, wasting your substance and alcohol and then you discover you've damaged your liver. There's nothing as sad as a young man, a young lady, Abandoning biblical values, abandoning the truth of the word of God. Because somehow it appears to be too restrictive. The young son felt that the religion of the Bible, the religion of his father was too restrictive. He wanted a church where he could eat anything and drink anything and do anything and live anyhow. And he found a place in a far country that allowed him to do just that. But the Bible said he spent all his vital forces began to dissipate his masculine power began to disappear. Her feminine charm and beauty, she discovered now that all that glitters was really not gold. He discovered now that something was hidden. The devil knows how to hide the hook behind the attractive bait. I said the devil knows how to hide. The devil knows what makes you tick. And he will craft your temptation because of the direction of your life. Listen to me carefully. I'm going somewhere. The Bible said, 
when he had spent all, have gone to the hospital to visit young men who had spent all. They thought all was going to be well into old age. Have gone to the bedside of men in their thirties dying from cancer. And if you think that's strange, this world is a rotten mess. And feebled and defective, laced with sin and destructive devices. And sometimes even the innocent gets caught up in it. I buried my own cousin dead at age seven from cancer. Listen to me carefully. He knew the values with which he was brought up, but they became too restrictive. The young man said to me, preacher, I love what you preach. I love the church you belong to, but it's too restrictive. Why is it that other churches allow me to go to wild parties and I can still go to church on Sunday morning? My pastor drinks, my pastor smokes, and he still preaches every Sunday. We can eat anything and drink anything. I am a Bible-believing child of God. And the Bible said, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God because your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Are you listening to me? So he took his journey away from what he thought was too restrictive. He took his journey into a place that was accommodative. He took his journey from his father's God. He took his journey from the relationship that was forged in the family. A relationship that circled around God and his word. Now he's out in unrestricted freedom. Do anything and live anyhow. And sooner rather than later he discovered his money was gone. He had lost his self-worth. He had lost his dignity. He had lost his honor. He couldn't stand to look in the mirror. And every time he looked in the mirror, he couldn't stand to see what was looking back at him. Where can you hide from yourself? Where can you run from your past? Where can you run from the real you that's you? Why do you think some folk commit suicide? They can't get away from themselves. They can't get past their past. They can't get past the messy life that keeps staring back at them. I'm talking to somebody sitting right here listening to me. I'm coming down your street. Maybe you've been coming here for nights. And every time you come by here... It's a wrestling match between light and darkness. A wrestling match between what you know and how you're living. A wrestling match between what God wants you to do and what the devil is calling you to. Let's go to our story. The younger son developed a detachment from the family business a detachment from the family religion, a detachment from family values, a detachment from godly values. The younger son left home with four T's given to him. He, he didn't originate them. You, you can't be the author of your own time. God gives us time. Life was given to us without our asking for it. Shh, 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 shh. Life will be taken from you one day, whether you want to let it go, yes or no. You and I are not the master of time. Time was lent to you. Use it wisely. And the only time we have, I told you last night, Whitney Houston's song, give me one moment. 
I've wasted the past. But give me one moment because I'm racing with destiny. Your destiny hangs in the balance today. Your destiny, hear me lady, hear me mister, your destiny, your eternal salvation hangs on a decision that you must make today. The Bible said, he left with the treasure, by the value, he gave him some of the values, he left with his talents, you know what the Bible said? Paul said, do not yield your instruments, your talents as instruments to unrighteousness. What does he mean, preacher? It means if God bless you with a singing talent, use it to glorify God. Life is more than money. Life is more than being on the number one pop chart. Life is more than all of that. Glorify God with the talents you have. Are you listening to me? I don't want to call him, but, but, but there's a young man right here. There's a young man right here. He's gifted. He's talented. And the top regular stars are oft after him. But up to this point, he has chosen to use his talents for the glory of God. And I tell him, any day he leaves the church, I'm going to kill him. Listen to me. He left home with the treasure. He left home with talents. But in a far country, the boy that used to sing in the choir, the boy that used to sing in AY, the boy that used to use his gifts and talents for the glory of God and true worship, now he is in a far country and all his talents, all his gifts are being used to glorify the devil and he feels sweet. But what he doesn't know, he was beginning to lose the gifts that God gave him. And sooner, the places he sang for money didn't want him anymore. The nightclubs that paid him a lot got tired of him. Listen to me. Thank you, co-preacher. He lost his voice. He lost the gifts. He lost the talents. You can lose what God has blessed you with if you use it to serve the devil. The psalm says he can create and he can destroy. And God is merciful. All along, he's using his talents. In the dance hall, in the nightclub, in a far country. His talents went. His treasure went. And time for pleasure was running out. His temple began showing signs of nightlife. His temple bleached out. Are you listening to me? And if you say he was female, parts of her was from China, part from Singapore, part from Taiwan, part from Japan. Because the stuff that God blessed her with, sin wore them out. Are you listening to me? The beauty is gone. Floppy disk show up in some places. So China came to the rescue. Huh? Don't provoke me, preacher. I'll go down further down the street. Listen to me, young people. Life is real. I serve a real God who deals with real people in a real world, in real life. Are you listening to me? And if you use your body to put food on your table, time will run out on you. Your body will wear out on you. Your beauty will disappear on you. Are you listening to me? She thought... Outside was so attractive. She thought 
It was such a wonderful thing for all the guys to say, hi, baby. I could kiss your picture to go to bed. Hi, baby. Heaven must be missing an angel. You want to say, and hell miss one too, because hell miss you? Listen to me. The devil is after the best that you have. The devil is after the best that God has. And the best you can do with your life is come back to Jesus. Give it all to Jesus. Put your hands in the hands of the man who steal the water. In a far country where he thought nobody knows him. So he could live anyhow. You can't run away from the values that was deeply embedded in you. That's why the word of God said to us parents, train up your children in the way that they should go. And even if they wondered, it will never depart from them. Why do you think when Christians sin, they have to outdo the worldlings. They're trying to fight against something on the inside. I'm almost done. Hang with the preacher. The things that the boy would never do when he was at home. The stuff he would never get mixed up in when he was following godly values. You have to understand the story is set in the context of a Jewish culture. He spent all. His money is gone. His friends are gone. The girls are gone. And if he were female, the boys are gone. One of the most painful conversations that I have ever had preaching in foreign land. I was in Costa Rica. 1970 something or 80 something landed in the rain every night it rained and they put me to stay in a wealthy neighborhood with a wealthy couple just by themselves in a big fancy house uptown I was left all by myself they made sure the fridge is filled with food. They made sure I had, they thought I was some hulk in my eating habit. Every day, all I heard was Spanish. Listen to me. Rained all day and it rained all night. But young people came out in their hundreds. And I was beginning to get discouraged by the rain. And when I turn on the TV, it's Spanish. Pastor Brown didn't teach me Spanish. Turn on the radio, it's Spanish. And bless your heart, I'm in my room discouraged. And I heard an English song. I heard an English song. And I got up and I ran to the veranda. And the song says, don't you worry about a thing now. Because every little thing is going to be all right. Hear me, everything in Spanish. And the one, even the lizard was crawling on the wall in Spanish. And the one thing I heard, and I believe that God is able to use anything or everything and send you a message. Got to church that Friday night. The young lady said to me, I don't talk to pastors, but you're a stranger. I want to talk to you tomorrow. I said, why not now? She said, I got to think about it. And the Sabbath now, my last day. We were at lunch. Remember I said, the young man moved to a far country. I told you he left with his temple, his time, his talent, and treasure. What I didn't tell you, he was taught to be a faithful steward. He carried the blessings of faithful stewardship. But in a far country, he squandered the time. No longer 
any time for worship. No longer any time for Sabbath keeping. No longer any time for clean eating. I mean, lobster tastes good and shrimp tastes good. And kung soup, who could get better than that? And crab and turtle, even John Crow that's barbecued might just taste good. Maybe they should try barbecue John Crow. Listen. So Sabbath came, I'm sitting at the table. And when we were through eating, she said, now I want to talk with you. And the pastor said, Brother Pastor, if she wants to talk, because she not talk to nobody, he said, excuse me, I will leave you too. He got up, his wife got up, her friends got up, we were left alone. I'm across the table and she's on the other side. She said to me, promise me something. I said, what's that? She said, promise me, if I start talking, you won't stop me. If the world is crumbling, don't stop me. Because for 20 odd years, I've bottled up some stuff that I want to let go. When you started on the first day, I wonder why did they tell you my story. And I started looking around in the church. And I set my eyes on pastor. I said, he must tell you. When you spoke the second day, I know the stuff you spoke about, I didn't tell anybody. So I began releasing the pastor from my craw. When you spoke on Wednesday night, I know God sent you just for me. She said, what I'm going to tell you, if half the folk out there hear it, they would never believe you. She said, I'll, I'm talking to you for two reasons. Number one, I don't know you. And number two, I heard you said your flight leaves at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> and me go make sure me not coming anywhere near the airport. The whole of the church going to come to see you off me at my yard. But if I start talking, don't stop me. Said I'm in a far country. I have a PhD in clinical psychology and 25 years of age. Good looking, even if you're blind, you can tell. But I've wasted my life. I've done stuff I'm not proud about. Change my address. I change my car. I change my job. I change my wardrobe, I change my music, I change my food, but how do I change what's happening on the inside? I'm haunted, I'm tired of pretending, I'm tired of crying myself to sleep, and something keeps telling me I feel like I'm walking naked. I've lost my robe. I've lost my covering and I can't go on like this. In a far country, he began to be in want. He lost his substance. He lost his self-worth. He lost his dignity. He is spitting on his honor in a hog's pen, a Jewish boy fighting with hogs for his breakfast. A Jewish boy, a member of the family of God, fighting with hogs for his supper. When the servants who were hired by his daddy, who were never born in his house, who never had the privilege of family connection, strangers entered the house. 
and had more value than him. Strangers whom he had one time looked down on. But the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And he said, the Bible said, when he came to himself, that's conviction. That's the acknowledgement that something's wrong with me. When he was leaving home, it was them, it was daddy, it was mommy. It was, when he was leaving home, the problem was with everybody else. But now, he comes to himself. And he can't blame anybody else. And my co-preacher said, it's not my mother, nor my father. It's not my brother, nor my sister. But it's me. I'm not talking to the person next door to you. Listen to me, worshipers. I'm not even talking to your parent or your friend beside you. God is talking to you. God is talking to you today with conviction, today to the altar, today to the water, because you need a brand new life. You need a brand new robe. You need a brand new beginning. You need a brand new you. And the dance hall can't give you a brand new you. Drugs can't give you a brand new you. You see the special group you're hanging out with who have no attachment to God? They can't give you a brand new you. Hear the preacher. Hear the preacher. So the text said, the text says, in that country, he lost everything. And he came to himself. Look at the first three words of verse 18. In this morning when, when God was downloading the stuff, he said, he said, son, underline some stuff in this verse. I said, what God? He said, underline the first three words. I, not my friend, not my brother, not my boss. I, I have to take responsibility for my own action. I have to face the truth as to what I have allowed myself to have become. I will arise. That's contemplative decision. But you can contemplate the decision and yet not make the decision. There are many folk here who have contemplated baptism not just since this crusade. Contemplative decision will not change your position. It's a good step. It's a good beginning. I said contemplative he contem I will arise. The next three things in the text that God said on the line, I have sinned. That's a confession brought about by a deep conviction. But verse 20 brings decisive action. So let me tell you what I told you. I told you that both boys lost their robe. I haven't gotten to boy two yet. I told you that the younger boy developed a detachment from the values of his religion, the values of his home, the values of God. And when he developed the detachment from godly values, at the same time he was developing an attachment to sinful values. The Bible said, and he arose and came. I love that. He contemplated it. But now, it was no longer a contemplation. He contemplated the action. 
Now he's executing the action. He thought about it and all the doubts and stuff, but now the doubts, even if they were not settled, his mind was made up. I'd rather die than stay here. I'd rather die than live one more day as a backslider. I'd rather die than live one more day disobeying what the Bible says. Let me run fast. The Bible said he arose and came. But while he was still a great way off, his father saw him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I serve a God who's waiting for you, looking out for you, patiently looking. The man in the middle, who would ever tell me, are you listening to me? Can I tell you a story? A boy, like this boy in our text, embarrassed the family. The mother did everything for him. Left home, became a wreck, went to jail, lost everything he had. Couldn't find anything to eat. His clothing turned to rags. People scorn him when he walked on the street. Have you ever abandoned your values that even though nobody is talking about you, when you're walking on the street, you feel the whole world is talking about you. It's your conscience that's bothering you. And so he wrote a letter. He said, Mother, I don't expect you to forgive me because I wouldn't even forgive myself. Mother, I don't expect you to have compassion, but I have no place else to turn. So, two weeks from today, and he puts the date in the letter, I'm going to take the train. It's two weeks now since the stent has been here. He said, I'm going to take the train. I'm going to walk up the road to the house. And if you have forgiven me, if I can still come home, put a white sheet on the line. She got the letter. What he didn't know is that she was praying all along for him. Waiting every day for him. Looking out every day for him. God is looking for somebody right here today. And she said, God, I don't know which way he's going to come. I don't know which lane he's going to take. So she went next door and borrowed one more white sheet. She went next door and borrowed one more. She went next door and borrowed one more and one more and one more and one more. And she asked the neighbor. She said, can you help me? And she pulled on all the wires she could find. And he said, she said to the neighbor, I want you to tie the wire all around the old house. And she hang the white sheet all around the house so you couldn't even see the house and he got off the train and he's in she's inside the house praying and he's coming up and he said but that's where the house used to be but all he's seen is white sheets white sheets white sheets and suddenly it dawned on him and he began running had no strength but he's running, tumbling over, but he's running, bucking his toe, but he's running. He said, devil, you're going to have to kill me running, but I'll see white sheets of forgiveness, grace, mercy, and loving kindness all around the old house. So when the boy got home, the father saw him afar off. And before he could open his mouth, the daddy said, bring the best robe. 
Bring the best robe. Bring the best robe. Because sometimes in church, we feel that the stuff we do, we go to church every Sunday or every Saturday. But hear me carefully. All our righteousness, filthy rags. I hear you. I hear your question. And I'm almost done. Pastor, how do I get a new robe? I'm ashamed of the past. I'm afraid of the judgment. I'm afraid of the future. I'm perplexed in the present. I try every day to make ends meet. But my past won't let me go. I was in New Jersey. The lady said to me, Pastor, money is not my problem. Job is not my problem. Man is not my problem. I have two problems. I can't change the past. I'm trying to get away from it. But every now and then, my tears flow. My heart aches. I said, oh, what needless pain you're bearing. Because you didn't bring it to Jesus. I'm not finished, but I'm done. Excepting for one thing. I told you, both boys lost their best robe. The younger boy became unattached from Christian values, became detached from church connection, became connected to the issues and the principles and the values of a godless society until he discovered he'd lost everything. I didn't tell you the finishing of my story with the young lady. She's crying and talking. I stretch my hand across the table to lend her moral support. And she cried and cried and she cried and cried and she cried for what seemed to be forever. And the strangest thing that I've ever seen, she dried her eyes and started laughing. I said, that's strange. She said, I now feel sorry for you. I said, why? She said, for over 10 years, I've carried this burden. And for the first time, it's no longer on my shoulder. And since there are only two of us in here, if it's not on my shoulder, it has to be on your shoulder. I said, sweetheart, what you didn't know when you told me that if I see you crying, I shouldn't stop you from talking. I called on the one person who can dry every tear. I called on the one person who's a burden bearer. I called on the one person who's a soul cleanser, a heart regulator, a mind fixer, a body healer, a restorer. I call on the one person who's got a righteous robe to take your nakedness and cover you so that you appear before the Lord God in the robe of Christ's righteousness as though you have never, ever, ever sinned. Prayed with her. I boarded the plane. She got my number from the pastor and called several times to say thank you. I said, no, thank God. I'm only God's messenger boy. The boy that wandered lost his robe in riotous living lost his robe in outright ungodliness he lost his robe in the far country but the boy at home 
lost his robe because he felt that to be religious was the same as being spiritual. He lost his robe while he was still attending church. I said he was still in the father's house. But as you read the story, you discover he also needed a new heart. Vindictiveness, anger, unforgiveness. Listen to me carefully. He said to his father, your son. He never said my brother. He said your son. He said to his father, you've never given me a kid when the day that the father divided the inheritance, he divided it among them both. There are some church folk, I don't know what else God can do for you. I said there are some church folk, I don't know what else God can do for you. In the church, with religion, but no life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. What did Jesus say to the Jews in Luke 6 and verse 46? Why are you calling me Lord and you are not willing to do what I tell you? There's somebody here, you've never left church. But you and God know you're not with Jesus. There's somebody here, you're going to church. But the word of God is not being obeyed by you. Maybe, like the woman, you have nine of the coins. You've lost one. It's time to light the lamp of the word of God. To be a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. I want to begin this morning before they start singing. I want to begin this morning before they start singing. And I'm going to ask you, son, keep your finger right where it is, on the same string and on the same key, but don't play. It's now you and God. So here's my first call. I'm beginning right where Jesus began. He said, I am come to seek, first of all, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I won't prolong the service. If you once walk with Jesus, if you were once connected with the values and the principles and the word of God's remnant church, and the devil dragged you away. Maybe you still come to church occasionally, but you know your heart has wandered from God a long time ago. I want you. I don't care who's looking on you. I don't care who sit beside you. I don't care the problems before you. I want you to get up right now and say, Jesus, I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. I want you to get up right now. Walk down this altar and say, Jesus, I'm coming to you. It's my life, Jesus, and only you can fix it. I'm coming to you. This call is yours. Get up right now. There is no music, son. There is no playing, son. Just the voice of the Holy Spirit on your heart. From down the back, God is waiting on you. He sees you in a far country. Start moving. Get up right now. I said, get up in the name of the Father. Get up in the name of the Son. Get up in the name of the Holy Ghost. And come. Come on to Jesus. Come on to Jesus. You once walked with God. I'm praying in my heart today. Today is your day of deliverance. Get up and come. 
get up and come. Get up and come. Say, devil, you're going to have to kill me today, but I'm going to Jesus. I'm going to Jesus. I'm going to Jesus. There is somebody else there. Yes, you know, you know you once walked with Jesus. Get up and come. This call is yours. You may be even on the outside. Hear me, backslider. Get up. Come on to Jesus. Don't waste your life any longer. Come on to Jesus. Don't throw away what you've got left. Come on to Jesus. Don't let the devil kill you in a pig's pen. Come on back. God bless you. God bless you. Come on. Come on. I'm not done with this group. I'm not done with this group. Holy Ghost tells me you're here. When God made me shift gear early this morning, God knew what he was looking for. He's looking for you and you and you, lost sheep of the house of Israel. Come on back. I see you come. I see you come from right on the back. Come on. Come on. Where are you, sir? Where are you? Where are you? If this was Sodom's last day, what would you do? If this was Noah's last day before the flood, what would you do? Get up and come. Come on. Come on. Whatever you've got to let go, cut loose and come. Cut loose and come. Praying in my heart right now. He'll break the chains that binds. He'll step right in your situation. Tear down the devil's barricaded door and give you victory. Lift your hands to God Almighty and come on. Resurrender your life. I'm a messenger of God to you. I may not be God's first voice to you, but I could be God's last voice to you. Come on. Come on. Like the mother. There's a white sheet at the throne of mercy for you. Like the mother spreading the white sheets. There are white sheets around the throne of mercy for you. There's a welcome mat at the door of grace with your name written on it. Come on. There's a custom made robe for a brand new start. Come on. I'm, I'm, I'm going one more time. Listen to me. Listen to me. I'm going to bear my soul today. You know you're still coming to church occasionally, but you're not there. Stop fooling yourself. You're not there. You come, but you're not there. And God says, I can't give you a robe while you're still dilly dallying. He asked me to read to you Acts 22 and verse 16. It simply says, and now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. God bless you. Come on. He said, why are you tarrying? If I were you, I'd be baptized and die rather than live and let the devil hold me a day longer. Come on. Get up and come. I see you come. I see you come. I see you come. There's somebody else. There's somebody else. There is no music because God wants to talk with you heart to heart. Get up and come. I'm waiting for somebody else. Well, let me go. Let me go to the rest of you. You've made your minds up to be baptized.